And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the craziest and, <laughs> and most insane ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Miltra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, the host and the party host, those are two separate things, of the Mind Scrambler podcast, and a man of, te of a thousand voices, all of them in his head, the one and only Spike Spencer. <laughs> how are you doing tonight, man? And Hello, baby. How are you? Good <laughs> to see you. Thanks for having me over tonight. That's great. <laughs> well... I say tonight out of habit, but then I remember, all oh, right, time zones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's uh, 11 a.m. on my side of the world right now. Which, you know, it's not the first time that I've had to, I've had to deal with the difference between Central and Australian time, but it always ends up driving me batty. It's, it is interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so um, in... I know it's been I know it's been about a month about a month or so since I brought you back into the temple. So how have you been in the interim? Um, lots going on, man. I got to tell you, we've had uh, a lot of shifts and changes in our life. Mm -hmm. um, one, I started culinary school, mm -hmm. uh, so that's an interesting, you know, <laughs> sidebar from being a voice actor in L.A. Boom, you're living in Australia. Bam, you're going to culinary school. Holy mm -hmm. balls. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what's happening. Uh, my wife is pregnant. We have uh, oh. our second baby on the way. Oh, congratulations. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all very exciting. I just got uh, a nice role that I can't say a damn thing about, but I think it's a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm excited about that. And, uh, yeah, we, uh, it's, uh, it's been crazy. Mm -hmm. been crazy down here. And so. Now, when it came to obviously you, obviously you and I have no have no short of ex of experiences when it comes to food. But um, were even before this, had you um had you taken any sort of culinary school beforehand, or were or up until this point, were you mostly self taught? Uh, self taught. I mean, I took a couple of courses here and there, like at uh, different like kind of cooking school, like like sur la table, mm -hmm. or you know. Is sur le table, you know what I say. It's a very French. <laughs> and um, so uh, I would take you know lessons here and there, and, and learn some stuff. But mostly, I was just a, a freaking Food Network addict, and uh, loved it, and always watching recipes and learning different things. But uh, being down here in Australia, and we we're staying because I mean, Qantas isn't flying. No, nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, well, if you want to stay, the only way we could stay is is either keep putting a lot of money down to extend our visas or just bite the bullet and say, hey, you know what? Let's plan to stay here for a couple of years, make the best of it, become a student, get a student visa, and then we're set for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, and plus I get to do something that I love to do. Yeah, I love to cook. I mean I wrote the book. Uh, food game, a man's ultimate recipe for dating success, mm -hmm. which is available on Amazon now. Go get yourself a copy; it's fantastic. <laughs> and uh, you know, it freaking works, guys. If you're dating, do that. Do what mm -hmm. I did. I seven years. I did this in Hollywood. Dated a lot. Had a great time mm -hmm. because I cooked. You and, know. And speaking of speaking of that, given given the whole given the whole cooking thing, um. I've had my fair sh I've had my fair share of stories where people have where people have tried to exp have tried to expand their repertoire with recipes and something like Food Network obviously helps, which leads me to ask a bit of a, a bit of a um, question. And this might this might this might be reach this might be reaching a bit, but what do you con what do you consider to be your learning style given you bring up um, Food Network? Hmm. Um. Well, I can break this down for you because this is some of the coaching that I do. It's like, you know, in, in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, you have ways that you bring in information into your life. Mm -hmm. So you're either visual, audio, um, kinesthetic, mm -hmm. or uh, audio digital, auditory digital. And so obviously that means you're visual, you're, you watch videos, or auditory, you're going to listen better, or kinesthetic, you kind of go by feel. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, oh, I, 
I feel, here's what I feel like doing now. And auditory digital is self-talk. It's like in your brain. I'm very high auditory digital and visual. So I'm always thinking about things. So when I'm watching a show, I'm breaking down everything that I'm seeing. And uh, so if somebody's, you know, here's how you're holding a knife. I'm like, oh, why is he holding that knife? How is he holding it that way? I'm watching and I'm really breaking things down. So <clears throat> I kind of like to MacGyver things. And that's my learning style. So when, when somebody is, you know, if they're auditory, they're going to listen to a lot of podcasts and they're going to learn that way. But you learn more by doing. So if you're visual, if you actually, uh, you learn more if you're, let's say you're reading a book and you're just silently reading that book, you're only pulling in like 10% of the information. So then you bump it up and you watch a video. You're actually bringing more. Or if you're auditory, you're bringing in more. And then video, you bring in even more. I think you're up to like 30% at video. But once you actually do the thing, you're at like 70% of understanding and knowledge of that thing. So, you know, the main thing to to do is if you like cooking, get in the freaking kitchen, mm -hmm. you know, do it. And I wanted to do the culinary school because I've never been actually trained in the real basic fundamentals, which is in anything, it's always go back to the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, culinary school is going to give me. And I'm going to be, you know, far better. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to those fun, when it comes to those fundamentals, were there was there anything in particular that you had to that you had gotten a new perspective on early on, or anything that you had to unlearn that you ha that you had ingrained? Yeah, actually, it was really funny. Um, now I haven't didn't learn this at culinary school at this culinary school, but there was another chef online that I took a quick course with and it blew my mind. He called me like five different things. I was like, holy crap, I've been doing it all wrong. So. Like uh, my knife skills are, are pretty good, uh, mm -hmm. pretty honed. I've been chopping things up for you know 30 years, and I've gotten pretty good at it. And I've been holding my knife wrong the entire time. <laughs> and I was just like, wait, what? Holy crap. And it made sense because like putting your thumb and your, um, your forefinger you actually on the blade of the knife and your other three fingers around the handle keeps the blade from slipping. And, you know, when you're cutting and that blade slips and – turns you can cut yourself not that i've ever done that of course you know i'm just saying <laughs> um i can show you some scars on my hand it's like oh well that's why that happened and now i'm relearning how to do that it's really nice but it's different mm -hmm. but it's those little bitty tiny tweaks in anything that you do in your life and you learn something and you're like oh man i've been doing it wrong all this time and now i just shaved off 20 percent uh, off of my production time or I've just made my whatever it is 20% better or my audio for this voiceover 20% better mm -hmm. and I've been doing it wrong for you know 20 years those kind of things are amazing little little tweaks and that's the only thing you only get that if you're really really getting down to basics and are open to being retaught mm -hmm. and when it when this is something this is something that can that I only re I only realized I should have asked um, after after our first one, but when it comes to when it comes to recipes, um, how how stringent are how stringent are you when following recipes? Now, obviously, when following it for a class, you got to be stringent. But just outside of that, do you consider yourself very stringent to a given recipe, or are you the type who will freestyle it when given the chance? Recipes are simply guidelines. That's it. Mm -hmm. Most of the recipes, when you actually do a recipe, mm -hmm. it won't taste that good. It's the weirdest thing. It's like I can take a recipe, and every now and then I'll get a recipe. I'm like, oh, damn, that was perfect. Like, you know, Thomas Keller's got this oven baked uh, tomato sauce, red sauce, that is phenomenal, which tastes just like the red sauces I was making in Italy when I was living there for a little while mm -hmm. on our honeymoon. And you know, I, these were ingredients that I had never thought to put together, and it was just amazing. But most of them fail. If you do a recipe, you're like, wow, that, that's really not that great. There's a reason because everybody, when they're doing a recipe, they're writing it down as best they can. But if you're an intuitive cook, then you're adding stuff right and left. You know, it's like, oh, I'm going to put a little pinch of this, a little pinch of that. Oh, it needs a little more of this. It needs a little more vinegar. It needs a little more sweet and a little more bitter, a little more sour, whatever it is. Yeah. And – in the end run, it's those teeny tiny tweaks 
that can really make a dish. Mm-hmm. Um, and it also depends on your ingredients. It's like, here, here's a, you know two cups of chicken stock. Well, where the hell do you get that chicken stock from? There's 9,000 different ways of getting the chicken stock. Mm-hmm. And that can change the entire flavor, especially if you like, like Vietnamese pho. That soup is phenomenal. Some of the best freaking broth on the planet. But how do you get that? How do you get to that point? There's all kinds of different ways. So yeah. anyway, I can go off on this for freaking. <laughs> but I think what I think um, much like with any kind of skill, every every chef or every cook, if somebody finds chef to be too too pretentious, even though I'm, I'm pretty sure in a few years you're going to be taking a photo of yourself wearing a chef hat. If you haven't already, actually, in a few weeks. <laughs> I hate being right sometimes. Well, but... now it's not. It's not that I'm going to be a chef yet. I'm, I'll be a chef probably in one year. I'll have my first uh, chef. Actual, I'll be able to call myself a chef. Mm-hmm. Chef de partie, which is I can be line cook that sort of thing. But it is mm-hmm. chef, and then mm-hmm. I continue, and then I'll go up to sous chef, yep. and that's really as far as I need to go because. Then, then it gets into oh you're only the executive the, the head chef because you run a restaurant or two restaurants and that sort of thing and I'm like I don't want to do that crap I just want to cook man so sous chef is fine for me but I get a hat next like in in a few in a month I'll have the whole outfit and my wife's really excited she's like you're gonna look so cute it's gonna be so <laughs> awesome you know and I'm just like oh jeez all right. <laughs> so, so she wants to like the neckerchief. She's like, that's gonna be adorable. <laughs> that's just get. That just puts way. T- that just put way too many bad joke images in in my head that I that I can't go into at this moment. But what I, what I was gonna what I was gonna ask is that, like with any field, there are people people are gonna have their strengths and their and their struggles. I don't want to. I don't want to say weaknesses because I find that's a bit um, loaded. But when it comes to when it comes to you, when it comes to cooking, do you consider have you considered yourself more of a generalist, or are there certain cooking styles or certain types of cuisine that you've tried to improve on, but it's been a bit trickier than others? Um, you know what has eluded me is really good fried chicken. Um, really? it's my favorite dish on the planet is fried chicken. I'm from the south. I'm from Houston, mm-hmm. born and raised. And last night I wanted. We, I was just dying for, I don't know if you ever had like southern green beans that are just boiled all to hell and uh, oh, yeah. in stock and onions and garlic and it's just phenomenal. You just mm-hmm. want to just, oh, give it to me. And I, I just really wanted that yesterday. I made my best batch yesterday. And that's that goes so well with like fried chicken uh, or barbecue. And uh, yeah, it's one of those things where I'm just like, damn, I'm, I, 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 that's tricky. Mm-hmm. Because there's so many things that there's so many different kind of batters, and some people are like, oh, just throw it in flour and some salt and pepper, or some you know cornstarch and salt and pepper, et cetera, et cetera. It's just like, yeah, I just haven't been able to get it. Where I'm like, damn, yes, I'm writing that down. I'm always doing it this way. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other one, I haven't really done a lot of. Um, well, let me take it back. So I do. Uh, I've been doing stir fry forever, mm-hmm. uh, Chinese stir fry, and it's it's really quite good. But you know when you get Chinese takeout, there's just something that you're just like, damn, what is that? I can't get that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will – I in the interest of – I could disclosure... just say, it's MSG, dude. But, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. In the interest of disclosure, I will, I will note that there are two, that there are, um, two things that I, I will freely admit that I'm bad at. And I'm, tr- I'm, trying, I'm trying to improve it, but it's definitely a struggle. One of them, oddly enough, is stir-fry. Um, mm-hmm. and yeah. it's it's largely it's largely just a reflex thing. The other is, I'm the, I am terrible with desserts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not a dessert guy, so I don't really mess with that. I mean, which is good. I'm I mean I'm gonna be learning a whole lot. I'll yeah. be you know, but I I'm just not not that. Um, I think some. Some of it probably co- some of it probably comes from the fact that I have to limit what desserts I can even make simply because I don't get along with chocolate. Mm, I'm sorry about that because I get along with chocolate. Yeah, yeah, you and everybody else. <laughs> some one of my coworkers thought that thought it'd be the height height of comedy to leave a chocolate cake on my desk on my birthday. <laughs> Which, how? 
I've certainly, I've certainly got a prankster streak in me, but I th but that's just cruel, man. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, I uh, there was this. It's called Mississippi Mud Cake. Mm -hmm. My my aunt made it. Um, growing up, it was always it's like a brownie with marshmallow stuff on top and mm -hmm. another chocolate layer and whatever the hell it is. It tastes like love. And I had the recipe. She gave me the recipe a long time ago, and I lost it. I got to get that again because, damn, that is one dessert I'm just I'm all about. That was just, ooh, so good. Sound, sounds like my family with with the holiday strudel every year. Most families ooh, get yeah. fruit cake around around the holidays. We get we get strudel, and that thing's mm -hmm. gone in about a day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but give, given that you've met, given that you've hinted about um different countries you've been in, different cuisines that you've that you've done. Um, a bit curious, especially given some of my audience and so, and some of where um, I trace I trace my line to. Have have you ever experimented with doing um, Danish cooking? Um, I have not actually. Um, I have been so. To make sure I'm clear with this mm -hmm. Danish Denmark. Mm -hmm. um, I was in Copenhagen, um, and the best restaurant on the planet, Noma, was in Copenhagen. And for for years, and I don't even know who's like number one now, but they're probably still up at the top. It's like a thousand dollars a plate, right? And um, we went there and we ate at a place called Marv and Ben's, I think it was. And it was like 300 uh, uh, for dinner at least, uh, maybe maybe four or five. Mm -hmm. And it was it was really good because the the style that Noma has is just really take ingredients and just freaking, wow, what the hell did you do to that thing that made it so, wow, you know? And uh, it was it was really an incredible meal. But as far as like Danish cookie, I haven't done. I mean, the one thing they did, I got to tell you, though, this is so awesome. The one thing they did, they gave us a it was like a hunk of cabbage, but it's like about about an inch thick, like a little like a little steak of cabbage. Mm -hmm. And uh, you cut it and you bite into it and it tasted exactly like freaking steak. <laughs> I kid you not. I'm like, you guys are what sort of sorcery is this? <laughs> yeah, it's... It is the taste of the devil. I remember, I remember, I'm I'm pretty sure I had the same reaction the first time I had the first time I had um tuna steaks. It's like this take Oh, this is great. No, it's great and it's cer and and given the diet that I'm on currently is great is great for me, but like I I um I've made it, I've made no bones about the fact that I'm from Minnesota and everybody ha everybody has their own their own preferred fish around here. <laughs> and the idea of a t of a tuna that tastes like steak when my whole life tuna has been that bland fish that pe people only eat as a last resort yeah and well that was one of my recipes uh i think i don't think it was in the book but i was going to put it in the book it was in my don't kill your date and other cooking tips uh roster mm -hmm. and it was the, the tuna steak and you uh basically you base it with honey and then roll it in uh, sesame seeds, yeah. and then uh, you pan, you sear that over open flame if you can, mm -hmm. real quick, both sides, and then oh my god, so good. Yeah, um, I will admit, I will admit that the go-to, the go-to for me when I can get when I can get away with it, making it, especially around the holidays, that's in the Danish end of things, is frikadeller. Gesundheit. What? <laughs> um. Frigid, the best way to describe frigadella is, for lack of a better term, Danish meatballs. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know what you're talking about. Now. Yeah, I. Um, the guy who the guy who taught me it insists on referring it by its proper name. He gets really mad if somebody call, if somebody just calls it um, Danish meatballs. Yeah. Um, is he's never explained why, but if I had to guess, it's his it's um, guilt by association because people think of that they think of Swedish meatballs and. Um, he has opinions about about Swedish food. Mm -hmm. Is that's the charitable way I can put it, right? Um. And he and um. I will I will admit it's some it's something that it's it's a work in progress. Um. But now I do want 
given given all given all of that, um, since you mentioned that there were certain recipes that di that didn't make it into into the into the uh, book, how to keep... <laughs> I'm cu I'm curious if the if when you were putting down recipes for that book, were, was it a case where you were were um you had kind of a hard cap of how many you were going to be able to fit? Well, I made it real simple. Um, what I decided to do was I put about 10 recipes in there mm -hmm. because if you throw too many recipes to somebody, it's like now it's a, it's a full on cookbook and they're like, Oh my God, I'm never going to learn to cook all this stuff. Blah, blah, blah. Yep. If you have like three dishes that you can cook really well, you can date a lot. Believe me. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have a lot of dishes I can cook really well. So I figured, all right, here's what we need to do. I need to get something that is like super easy uh, everyone, the guys could do like five dishes or less, or if it's more ingredients, throw it in a pot, turn it on. Super easy. Mm -hmm. So this is why I went with stuff like beef bourguignon, which is harder to spell than it is to make. It's, you know, it's real simple. You put it all in a slow cooker, which by the way, uh, I wrote an article mm -hmm. years ago called, uh, the slow cooker, your dating secret weapon, <laughs> because it's so amazing. You put all this stuff in the slow cooker, put the lid on, turn it on, leave. By the time in the evening, your place smells like a French bistro and all that stuff is cooked and you've got – basically you can have a beef bourguignon. You can have chili. You could have um, one of my favorites, uh, which is um, – oh my god. I just went up on it. Uh, cassoulet, mm -hmm. which – was one of my go-to sort of a, a sort of cassoulet. I mean, real cassoulet. It's like, oh, you've got to have uh, duck and this, and then I'm like, look, chicken, sausage, beans, tomatoes. Boom, you're good. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, add some red wine and some crusty bread, and damn, you're in a bistro. It's so mm -hmm. good. So I wanted that kind of thing. Very very simple. And of course, I have some dishes for breakfast because hey, the night can go really well. Yeah. So I got you covered on that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, several real simple things. So that's in the dating world. I got that covered in the mm -hmm. cooking world. Super simple. Um, yeah. You know, and it's it's just a great thing to have to be able to cook. You start to get a, a you start to get a respect for the food and you start looking into things like organic food and, you know, what's going on, what's getting actually put in our food, like mm -hmm. glyphosate with Roundup and all that crap that's going on. So it's it's good to be aware. And plus, you know. Eating out in restaurants is really expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, as, as you mentioned, like, the place that ha that has a th that has thousand dollar dishes. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, like Kim, she's like, you know what? We don't really have to go out because she's like, you cook better than most of the stuff we get out anyway. Mm -hmm. And she's right. So you know, but I love to go out and eat. I love to try new things. Um, oh, I, I got to tell you, though, uh, foodie wise, anybody who's a foodie is going to love this. So I have had the best meal on the planet, literally twice, mm -hmm. because we honeymooned in Italy in 2014 in the fall, actually the winter or like December. And we stayed in a place called Monelia, which was just north of Cinque Terre, which is, uh, anyone to know, it's way up in the north of uh, Italy. And it's God, stunningly gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And we loved it. We just loved that town so much. And there was a little restaurant there called Acerto. And we went in, and I mean, literally it was maybe eight tables, small ones. And Luca, the owner, comes out and talks to you. And they had like five things. And like, um, so what's what's good? He said, eh, well, you try this. Uh, this is a sea brim. We caught it uh, right out there. And uh, uh, this, oh, this, this oil is uh, olive and the uh, orange, uh, which uh, came uh, from uh, right over that ridge uh, over there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, he's just, and he's just going off and telling me all these things. And we ate the most amazing food. Simple, mm -hmm. perfectly done, excellent food. And we loved it so much we came back. It was like 200 bucks every night that we did that. Yeah. And um, we found out literally like like last year that we, we didn't even realize. But Forbes magazine said in 2015, like a month or two later, that Acerto was the best meal on the planet. And we ate there twice. <laughs> Boom! Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that, um, I think that's probably the biggest flex that I'll hear all week. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say all year because because that's a bit preemptive. We're only ju we're only just out of the first month. That's but right. It, it's de 
and also I um given that given th that I come from the tabletop world, I am as superstitious as any as anybody else is. Um and you do and the one thing you do is don't jinx. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah. We're so I mean anyway, that's that's yeah, that was uh, such an exciting food thing for me. I mean, that's my I love food and I love eating all over the world, so and when you had when you had mentioned about the book, you had you had made the remark about it, about it. Um, not you didn't want it to feel too much like a cook like a cookbook. Have you when? What the way you said that? Um, guess I'm guessing that there are certain disagreements you have with how a lot of cookbooks present themselves. Yeah, I mean. Cookbooks are like anything else. They're books, mm -hmm. and some people like them. Some people don't like them. Um, it always comes down to me and say, hey, what uh, what are you trying to accomplish with this cookbook? Because it's like, here's a cookbook with 9,000 recipes that you're never going to make um, because you're not. There, it's There's going to be like one or two people who are going to actually go through and do the actual dishes. Mm -hmm. I mean it was such an interesting thing is because that's, that's what was in um, – that movie, My Dinner with Julia, mm -hmm. you know, because that was a thing she said. I'm going to go through it. I'm going to make every recipe. And, and wow, it's so odd that they made a freaking movie, you know. Mm -hmm. And so you just got to find out what, who's actually making the recipes and, and what is it trying to do. Because I know, for example, my cooking got so much better in Italy and nobody showed me anything. I have no idea why. It was the, the – the recipes, it was the – I mean there were no recipes. I just cooked with what we had mm -hmm. and it was just phenomenal. I have no idea what what, what I did. I haven't been able to, to replicate it as, as well since then. But with, with cookbooks, they, they throw so much stuff at you and it's like once you do the recipe like we said earlier, it's like that that's not all that great. You know, it's not mm, – no. Nah. So every now and then like, like I was saying Thomas mm -hmm. Keller – um, I had one of his books. Um, I still have it. It's in Burbank, 7,000 miles away from me. And uh, I did some of those recipes in there, and those were phenomenal. Mm -hmm. You know, And it just depends. My book, I really wanted to make it simple so that guys would actually do it. You know, Take a few minutes and actually do it. Yeah. You know, Because uh, I've seen other, like, quote-unquote, dating cookbooks, and it's like, dude, not a guy in the world is going to make this stuff. It's even hard for me, and I'm quite advanced. You know, it's like, no, nah, no, no, no. <laughs> make it easy, guys. Make it easy. Now, I I can make my guesses as to the as to the way some um some make it difficult, and I'd I'd imagine that it's unintentionally. Do you, in your experience, what a lot of times when it's made difficult is it? Would you say it's a case of the the person writing the cookbook having a bit too much of a inside mindset, for lack of a better term. I'm sorry, say that again. Um, when it comes now, this is this is something that I could easily see happening because of you got simply because of inter of an internal bias. But would you say that with a, with some examples of cookbooks, the writer is a bit too inside? Like he's like he's writing it for he's writing it for himself and for other cooks instead of for any instead of for any old bachelor who might want to try cooking. Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, they're they're. Yeah, I mean, a lot of them are writing it to maybe impress other people. You know, I'm thinking I want people to do the recipes and play with them. Mm hmm. You know, I mean, that that's the only cookbook I've written. That's probably the only one I'm going to write, but who knows? I mean, I may may write more, but um, I, mean, I did have an idea for a cookbook called Eat My Anime, and uh, <laughs> I was going to go and, and I was trying to figure out a way to get dishes that were anime-inspired or, you know, something from some different anime characters that I've done or my friends have done, and I said, what's their favorite dish? And it's always, oh, it's ramen. I'm like, well, fuck that. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, it's always ramen. It's Japan. No, something different, you know, something weird, mm -hmm. and uh, have fun with that. But I have kind of put that on the back burner. But you know, I think the, some of the best cookbooks that I've read just really love the food. It's just all about food. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
I don't know. Like some of the celebrity chefs, I'm like, you know, really? Uh, huh. Like Bobby Flay has a style. I like his style. Very cool. Emerald has a style. Great. But, you know, I have Emerald's cookbook. I have Bobby Flay's cookbooks. And I've done some different things out of those. And I'm like, you know, Emerald, I love you. Good showman. Some of your recipes, I don't, you know, hmm. I think you could do better. <laughs> you know, I mean, I sent, I sent food back to his restaurant twice. I sent food back because it was not good. Mm. This is at, uh, this is down in Florida, Chop Chop. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, dude, that's just not good. And, uh, so, yeah, so I was really, really sad about that because <laughs> I really like him. Uh, he's, he, um, <sighs> There's no prop. There's no proper word for this, and it's it's one of those things that people either, that perf- people, especially performers, either have or they don't. The best that I've heard is the it factor, and somebody like somebody like Emerald definitely has that. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, it can lead to people having the assumption that somebody is more show than go, but that's a can that's a can of worms for another day. Well, he's the real deal. Mm-hmm. I mean, don't get me wrong, but oh, it's one is. of those things where it's like, at what point do you go, huh? Um, uh, you've expanded yourself too far. Like I went to, um, oh, it was in, in LA in Burbank. There's a, I think it's Guy Fieri's little restaurant there. Mm-hmm. It was awful. It was awful. And I love Guy Fieri. I think he's phenomenal. And, uh, but yeah, that restaurant was awful. It's like when you get to the point where it's like, I have 25, you know, restaurants or a hundred restaurants coast to coast. It's like, yeah, so are they any good? That's the point. And you can, um, I guess, I guess the be- I guess the best way to put it is some sometimes sometimes a log is just a log. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Even if you've got a hundred logs, you still have logs. Yeah. <laughs> and now shift now shifting a bit. I did w- I did want to go into the. Um, project that you've been that you've been working on, the Reluctant Hero's Journey, because mm-hmm. we we kind of dipped into this last time, but because of how wide of a net we were casting, and look, I look, I can make fishing jokes all I want. I'm from Minnesota, <laughs> <laughs> but how, but I'm curious how how um that particular project really start really started out, and what and what the plan is um, for it. I'm assuming you're talking about the Reluctant Hero's Journey? Yes. Okay. Well, the Reluctant Hero's Journey came out of over about 13 years of talks. It started out as, um, you know, in dating. It was don't kill your date and other cooking tips because I was learning to date again after a horrible divorce and a bankruptcy, losing everything and starting over from Mm -hmm. literally nothing. And I had to build myself up. And food game is what don't dkyd became so don't kill your date and other cooking tips many people probably people listening now may have seen me you know do that live and early on it was just basically it was the guy hey let's get drunk and talk about food and sex you know and then it came got to the point where it's like going hey here's some of the things i'm actually learning to become a better person Mm -hmm. and and to really get in the personal development and and growth and then it became um i still do don't kill your date and other cooking tips, but that became food game, uh, which you know it became like, hey, this is what I'm actually doing in the dating world mm-hmm. to to date amazing women. I mean, I dated a Jedi, I went out with a playmate. I mean, come on, um, I know what I'm talking about, and I married my amazing wife, who is an ex Miss California contestant, and uh, I can list the amazing things that she's done, and. She's also 19 years younger than me, by the way. And you can even see uh, our journey on Netflix uh, on a show called Being Dad. Uh, Being Dad, and it was from the Chicken Soup from the Soul uh, production company because of our age difference was interesting. And I was having a baby. Uh, She was having a baby. I was 48 and having my first child. Mm -hmm. So they followed us on that. Um, So if you want to, you know, see some of the inside of that, it's very cool. But um, so I know it works. So as far as like dating world and dating coach stuff, that works. But the main thing that I really was teaching was self-confidence and, you know, being a better person because that's that's what's in food game. It's like, look, guys, I can show you how to cook and you can 
can cook and have dates and that's great. But listen, you've still got to be the guy mm-hmm. that is going to attract a woman over to your apartment where you're alone with them in a secluded spot while you wield a large cutting instrument. You see, <laughs> there's got to be some some safety there. There's got to be some respect and you have to be quite attractive. Mm-hmm. And that all comes from inside. And then it blossoms out. It's not just about dating. It's about life. It's about family. It's about business. It's about everything in your life starts on the inside. And that's where that came from. So I started doing uh, – really getting into that for the nerd and geek world and calling it the reluctant hero's journey because that is pretty much the archetype mm-hmm. of almost every hero if you look at it. You know, you look at uh, Bilbo Baggins, Frodo Baggins. Uh, look at Shinji from Evangelion. You know, these are people who just you know, ordinary, ordinary beings who had to step up and become all that they could be. Mm-hmm. And they were scared. They weren't ready. And this is that's life. That's what most of us are in in a place where hey, we want to do better. We want to have things. We want to have confidence and self esteem. How do I do that? Well, here you go. I coach mm-hmm. because I am a certified coach in NLP, certified bank. Uh, personality sales trainer. Um, I've trained with some of the best coaches in the world, and my wife is a high perf- certified high performance coach with with Brendan Bouchard as well, and I've trained with him a little too. Uh, and that's Oprah's coach, so we know what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and you know, I did it for 15 years myself, actually in the field. So when I tell people, "Hey, I can help you guys," and you know. In our world, the geek, nerd, gaming, animation, anime, sci-fi, fantasy, whatever, Mm -hmm. there's not a lot of personal growth and personal development. People don't really even understand what that is. Like you talk about Tony Robbins or Jim Rohn or Zig Ziglar or any of these people. They're like, who? What? What -hmm. kind of name is Zig? You know, it's it's interesting because people don't really have that and they want that. And I've talked to people in the in the um, you know people that are in the in my journey already, which is it's a membership group. Mm-hmm. So it's an ongoing, it's a monthly membership group. And right now I'm about, I'm about to open it up again uh, next month for uh, registration because once it's closed you can't get in. And then what I do inside the group is I train, I coach a little bit. I mean it's not a lot because obviously I can't. I'm, I'm, I do a one-on-one with me is quite expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, but I said, you know what? I, I can do this. I can help. So I put together a membership group. And uh, once a week I have a challenge for you, simple, simple stuff uh, that you can apply to your life. And then once a month I do an actual one-hour training where I'll pick a topic like confidence. I'll say, let's talk about confidence today and mm-hmm. give you tips, tricks, training, techniques to build your confidence, to actually have it. Not a not a trick that is short-lived. It's something that you can actually do. Because I've been reading, I've been into self-development since I was, gosh, since I got out of high school. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I was like Tom Cruise in that movie Cocktail. I always had a self-help book underneath when I was bartending. And so I've, I've been through a lot, and I know I can help. So that's what the Reluctant Heroes journey is. It's like come in, get some training. It's cheap. I mean $20 a month, what is that? A couple of meals at McDonald's? Okay, skip those and spend it on yourself. That's the first tip. And you, you get a whole lot more uh, return on investment when you invest in yourself. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. And most people don't do that. They don't understand what coaching is. You know, I'm not a life coach. That's not, that's different. That's something that is not quite <clears throat> what I do. And so that's why I'm, I'm asking people. It's like, hey, if you want these things, then you have to do something. You can't say, oh, man, I really wish I was in better shape or, you know, it's like, I wish I was in better shape. Okay, go do a push-up. Nah. Okay, well, then nothing's going to happen. But if you can change who you are on the inside – You become more magnetic, more attractive Mm -hmm. to other people. So like, guys, you want a girlfriend, become more attractive. Ladies, you want a boyfriend, become more attractive. You want to do things, you want a better business. Hey, become more attractive. (laughs) More attractive for that thing, for the other person, for that business, for that family members. You want to straighten up your family members. Become more attractive to your family members, Mm -hmm. more magnetic, you know. So anyway, I get excited about it, as you can tell, because (laughs) – 
it helped me. It saved my life. Mm-hmm. Literally, it saved my life. And since you mentioned confidence, that's one that's one thing that I do I do want to delve into a bit. And I need to give a bit of context for for this next for this next question cuz now obviously I've used um I've used ta- I've been using tabletop gaming for want to want to say about 18 want to say about 18 years to help to help um people connect with each other since it's de- it's definitely a lot more hands-on of a form of geekdom than than a, than a lot of other fields um but something that i something that i often see is is people um, people saying that they they like to try but 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 they can't but they can't because either they couldn't get a game group together or they could or they think it's too complicated or that they don't want to go through that many books or so, something like that and when it comes to confidence when it comes to self-help what what from your perspective were some of the most common um op- some of those common obstacles that people have brought up to you and I'm not asking for specifics but just just general feels and what typically has been your res- has been your response to some of them well the first one is always there, there's always money and they're mm-hmm. always like oh I don't have enough money I say well guess what your subconscious mind is listening to you right now you say you don't have enough money guess what you're never going to have enough money you have to take a choice you have to take a chance mm-hmm. you have to do it you have to say, all right, I am worth investing in myself because you'll say, I don't have enough money to invest in myself $20 a month. However, you'll go out and buy another anime or another video game. So you can do what? Sit at home and not go out and talk to any other people, not go out and do anything, but be by yourself. And the cycle continues. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm fine. If there's people who want to do that and that's their thing, good, great. You're not my people. But there are people who don't want that. The people are saying, you know what, man, I want to get out there. I want, I want to go. I want to travel the world. I want to, I want to meet people. I want to have fun. But I'm so in my own cocoon that it frightens me. It's like, that's fine. I get that. You have to invest in yourself. Mm-hmm. You have to move forward. So when people say that, oh, I don't have enough money, well, then that's fine because that's a story that you're telling yourself because you choose. And you, lo- I go really, really deep into this kind of stuff. Because that's a problem for so many people. They're like, oh, I don't have money. Yes, you do. It's your choice of what you do with it mm-hmm. that matters. And when you invest in yourself, you're paying a whole lot better dividends. I can guarantee you that. That's an amazing part of it. Um, and that's so because it's a story that's based on a lot of other junk that other people are telling you. Mm-hmm. So that's one. And the other one is, you know, there's a fear. There's a fear of the unknown. You know, it's like, I really want to have confidence, but oh my God, that means I'm going to have to talk to people. Oh my God, I don't want to do that. But yes, I really, really do want to do that, but I want, I, but I can't, but I want, but I can't, but I can't. And it just vicious cycle and it goes over and over again. So one of the great things about this membership for me is that it is a membership group and it's a, it's a Facebook group. It's very simple. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have to get up in front of anybody and say anything. You can connect with people. I get people who have developed friendships inside there for life, you know, and but it's support. So it's it's a membership group that you can go in every day. You can look in there. You've got all kinds of challenges that I can give you that are easy and free. you got training. you got videos. Plus, there's another thing I forgot to tell you. So I have my Mind Scrambler podcast, mm-hmm. and I bring in guests. Like I just had Tasia Valenza. Uh, who was the the voice of the Shinjo computer in uh, Discovery, and mm-hmm. she plays an Ivy, et cetera, et cetera. And the week before, I had Mark Pellegrino, who plays Lucifer on mm-hmm. Supernatural. And I've got Jennifer Hale coming, and I've already I've already interviewed her. So, and if you don't know who Jennifer Hale is, oh my God, she's the number one voice actress on the planet. It's in the Guinness Book of World Records, people. And she's a friend of mine, <laughs> and we chatted about personal growth and self help because she's all into it. And that's coming up. Well, here's the deal. Inside the group, I go live inside the membership group. You can meet these people that I'm going to be talking to mm-hmm. because that's where I do it live inside the membership group. And then I tape it and goes to YouTube and goes to my, you know, to my podcast, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So not only do you get, you know, all the training that you could possibly want that's going to help you. I mean, I've had people that have come through there and said, hey, this is really great, but I want more coaching. And I've worked with them one-on-one. And they're like, holy crap, this is amazing. I've got all the testimonials. It's on the site. I mean, mm-hmm. dude, this is – there's nothing 
you know, nothing, I'm just not, I've got people to back it up. And my, my thing is this, guys, if you really want more out of life, you want more confidence, you want more success, you want more money, you want more dating, men, women, whatever, I don't care. It does whatever you want. You want more out of life. Mm -hmm. You have to take the first step. No one can do it for you. No one. Because you really are in charge of your own life. Mm -hmm. And I will show you how in charge of your own life you are. That's the part. Because when you see, wow, it really is up to me. You go, oh, wow, that's amazing. And then you go, oh, crap, it's all up to me. <laughs> so um, that's usually the, the situation. It's like, wow, I have to do things. Yes, you do. But if you want it enough, you will. And when it can't, when when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the whole um the whole thing the whole thing with the with the process of it um i'm kind i'm kind of curious why um why you dis why you decide to go with the name the reluctant hero's journey cuz obviously i end up hearing that and i end up thinking of the hero's journey in and of itself but was there was there a bit of a background as to the as to that particular as that particular name well, it was basically it it was the thought of looking at Shinji, really. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that. It's like, you know what? He's a hero. Shinji was a hero. And I've had so I've had so many people come up to me over the course of gosh, you know, thir twenty five years mm -hmm. and say how that impacted them. You know, and they wanted they found strength in his story. Well, he was a reluctant hero. And I got to thinking about it. I was like, oh, wow, look at all these other reluctant heroes. Freaking John McClane in Die Hard was a reluctant hero. <laughs> look at almost any show. Mm -hmm. Somebody is thrust out into being a hero, and they're like, I'm just a guy. Yeah, well, guess what? Now you're a hero. You know, holy crap. So it was the reluctant hero's journey because that was – also, kind of my my story too. After my divorce, I didn't I didn't want to start over. I thought I had a great life, and then it was gone, yanked out from under me. I had no choice, you know. So I had to do that, mm -hmm. and I I had a choice to make. I said, you know, either I'm going to basically just die and give it all up and just quit, or I'm going to become something far greater than I was before, and that's what I decided to do. And here I am living in freaking Australia with an amazingly beautiful wife, a three-year-old and a baby on the way and just landed a, another big role that's coming out and uh, very excited. I mean, so you can do it. You can do it. I believe in you. <laughs> I think I think I guess with I guess with that, we fulfilled our um, we fulfilled our water boy quota for the week. <laughs> there you go. Um, and what now? Um. I realize I've kind of done I've kind of done this sort of thing out of the completely out of order, but um, last time that I last time that I had you on, we did um, we did we did talk a bit on um, on er, on early days with with an, with animation and a f and a few think a few things from the glory of the glory of the eighties, and I was something I was curious about is and maybe this is get, veering a bit too far back. Um, mostly because I just need things to be balanced. What, what was your, what was your first introduction to just, an, not just anime, but just animation, period? Man, uh, whew, wow. Um, what was it? Gosh, when I was a kid, I'll, the but first thing I remember, I think, would have been like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Charlie Brown. I think those are my first animation stuff, yep. um, you know, because I, I grew up on that stuff. I mean, we're talking about, you know, early 70s for so me. With Rudolph, I'm, get, um, I'm guessing you're referring to the um, the Rankin Stop Bass me. stuff? Yeah, mm -hmm. love that stuff. And, um, yeah, and, and Charlie Brown. I remember, I just, I loved those. Uh, of course, Looney Tunes, mm -hmm. and my favorite Looney Tunes were always the ones around Halloween, I just love that. You know, it's yeah. like, oh, Halloween, they're going to have the ghosty ones and the scary <laughs> ones. And I just love that so much. It's it's it kind amazing. of it's kind of funny that the that the two 
whether it be Merry Melodies or, or Looney Tunes, the two sh the two shorts that apparently are the highest that are the highest regarded from the, from those days was um, What's Opera Doc and Duck Amuck. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I know the What's Opera Doc. Mm -hmm. That's that was yeah. basically one giant parody of Wagner and Duck Amuck. From what I from what I recall, the story behind that one was ch was um. I think it was either Chuck Jones or somebody else had had said, "Is it really going to be Daffy Duck if we change this one thing?" And then that just spiraled into its own gimmick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I loved those. I I just absolutely loved Looney Tunes mm -hmm. and always have. I think my favorite. Well, my my first uh, marriage was actually the Looney Tunes wedding, and uh, we had all kinds of Looney Tunes figurines all around. Uh, everywhere and uh, when we walked down the aisle we said I do and then we turned and walked down the aisle and they had a guy on a guitar going <laughs> so mm -hmm. you know that was all all cute and everything until it fell apart <laughs> um, down the road Ooh, it was awful um, but uh, yeah I mean I, I've always had a fan I've always been a fan of animation mm -hmm. for sure my first anime would be uh, probably Speed Racer yeah which don't, that um that certainly doesn't that certainly doesn't surprise me um <laughs> a couple of years ago i ended up i ended up taking a look at the first attempt to try and do a american speed racer <laughs> as yeah. a as a follow up and um god bless them for trying but um it wasn't the same <laughs> it just it just didn't it just didn't work and I, and i want to make clear this was bef this was before even the wachowskis tried to take a crack at it and that was another case of I'll give them credit for trying, but that's as far as I can go. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting. I remember watching that. I think I think it might be something that I'd want to watch again, to be like, well, you know, I guess I could see this or that. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it was it was odd. Yeah, I, I love the Matrix, for example, is one of my top all time mm -hmm. favorites. I mean, absolutely. Love the Matrix, yeah, and all, all three of them. You know, people are like going. The first one was amazing, and the next two are like, "Oh my God, they're crap." I'm like, I thought they were great. I'm really excited to see what they're going to do with the next one. You know, that's that matters. For me, it's a, I I treat it I treat that the same way I treat the upcoming um Get a Robo arc, and that is with cautious optimism. Yeah, mostly because there's been such a huge gap, and in, in the case of the latter case. Putting aside the fact that I've had had a um, long-standing love for going to guy's work, um, Get a Robo Arc was the la was the last one in that series that never finished because the the uh, writer for it had uh, passed away before it could finish up. Yeah. And now that's getting adapted after all this time. It's the it's the time factor that's more that's more of a concern since, um, for lack of a better term, ring rust is a thing. Yeah, you know, being being away from a particular project for so long and then suddenly coming back, um, something some things just aren't going to be as um, intuitive. But when it came, which is is interesting, you're probably the first person to bring up Speed Racer when I whenever I bring up people's early days of of animation. Yeah, because um, a lot a lot of times. The most the most common response I get is well at the time we knew it as Robotech. Um, yeah. Obviously, we, obviously time has illuminated that issue. Right. But it, it it's definitely it's definitely an interesting shift. And I think so, I think something else that's interesting when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to times between animation is under. And I only I only um really started delving into this in the last few years, is understanding all the shortcuts, or at least as many of the shortcuts as I can find. Are you familiar with the, Are you familiar with the term sakuga? No. Um. Animation, especially especially um especially with anime, and even more so with television animation, has to do a lot of cheating. Whether it be whether it be reusing at reusing animations, sometimes reusing cells, and yeah, um, lo largely, I mean, yeah, there's definitely the budget issue, but a lot of times there's the issue of time. Um, mm -hmm. With a lot of U.S. animation, they 
this is this tends to be circumvented by outsourcing parts of the animation to other studios internationally. Right. Like I, th I think with a lot of um, like with like I remember with Animaniacs, they had one they had one studio in Japan and one studio in China that was helping him out and stuff like yeah. um, Little Nemo, if you remember that, that was animated by TMS, um, Tokyo Movie Suesha. That's what is it? At least I think that's the um, acronym. It's been a while. Yeah. But hold on one second. Hold that thought. Go ahead. Um. But but um the term but the, but ain't but to kind of bring it full circle the term sakuga is for is for when a lot of anime studios will reserve a certain amount of reserve a certain amount of the animation budget for a specific scene or a specific moment and that's when they really start upping the frame rate and start upping detail. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Especially since. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're they're trying to they're obviously going to use reuse things yeah. as, as much as they can or mm -hmm. tweak them. And why not? Of course you would. Yeah. Um, but I mean, <laughs> you know, we're, we're famous for that with mm -hmm. uh, the original Evangelion at the end, near the end, when they were <clears throat> just uh, well, you've heard the rant. So yeah. <laughs> yes, I I've heard the rant. I've don't worry, fo don't worry, folks. I'm from the internet. <laughs> um, <clears throat> on the interwebs. Mm -hmm. But so. the the other thing I ended up learning when I when I started um when I started delving into started delving into it is the difference between animating on ones or twos. Um, like dude, a, I got nothing on that. Yeah, um, <laughs> no. Idea. It's mostly the the difference between animating on ones or animating on twos is how many individual. Um, illustrations. How many individual frames are used each? Um, so, sorry, how many individual animations are used for each frame? Yeah. So, something like a Disney movie is animated on once. You right. got one unique illustration for each frame. Okay. Um, it's it's almost like look looking at how it works is almost like looking at say a time signature. So, there's a difference between three four time signature and like. One two time signature, right? Um, whereas some that's animated on twos has a unique animation, for, has a unique image for every other frame, right? Which is why you and it's it's one of those things that you don't that you're not you're only going to really notice when you start looking at um frame rate. Um, but going back to the whole going back to the whole eighties thing. Um, do you rec do you recall? Do you recall your first entry when it comes to when it came to a uh, film, like when it came to actually actually going to actually going to the actually going to the movies? Because I'm sure I'm sure we've all we've all had our we've all had our fair share of that movie. <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, first movies. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. I really don't know what the first thing. I I I, I will tell you this. Mm -hmm. I went to see Jaws. So when did okay? Let me. I'll tell you. I'll figure this out. Okay. So Jaws. When did yep. Jaws come out? Jaws. I believe that was late. Nineteen seventy-eight. Yeah, nineteen seventy-eight. No, 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 no. That was Jaws two. Okay, hi. Jaws. Nobody. Jaws release date. Um. Let me USA. see. Seventy-five. Yeah. Seventy. Okay. Seventy-five. Yeah. So I was six. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> so I'm about, here. I am. I'm like. I'm like six. Mm -hmm. Six seven-ish. You know, and we're popping in to go see Jaws. Now, I did not make it past the first scene. And I was like, "Who oh, we go?" So I remember we went next door and saw Murder by Death, <laughs> which, was, which was hysterical, actually, very funny, funny film. And uh, you know, so I think that might have solidified my my comedy stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I remember that. I don't know what I saw. If I saw anything before then, wait. When so Star Wars was seventy seven, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I saw Star Wars. I remember that. I remember seeing Star Wars in uh, Louisville, Texas. And um. And uh, so that was that was yeah. So I definitely remember that. But as far as movies go, I, yeah, that would be. I got. I gotta say. I gotta go with Jaws, man. That would be stupid to be the first movie I ever saw. Um, 
Well, uh, like I um, I can pro I can probably I can probably raise you one as as far as movies that I was probably too young to see, because <laughs> yeah. um, one of my one of my one of my early film experiences was um the original Alien. And oh, I, dude! <laughs> yes. I specific specifically see, and I specifically remember because this is burned into my this has been burned into my memory for years walking in on walking in on the showing of that just when the chest burster happens oh boy yeah that'll do it <laughs> you think I you think I would learn but then I'd end up having a similar thing happen about a year later with the thing oh that is one of my all-time favorite horror movies oh my god uh, I I love I love don't get it wrong I love the movie and I did yeah. eventually read the original who goes there Mm -hmm. But I was wait. But that was one of those things. I was way too young because because having a film about paranoia and having it be in a in a frozen wasteland when I live in a frozen wasteland was something probably not the best idea for a young mind to have. <laughs> probably not. No. Probably not. Um. But I I will admit that if I could go back if I could. If there's one thing I could have, if there's one thing I wish I could have done, if I actually had a time machine, it's watch and see people's initial reactions to Star Wars Episode Four. Hmm. Um, because obviously by the time I had finally seen it, Star Wars was this ubiquitous <laughs> cultural icon and all that. But yeah. I would have, I would have loved to have seen, to have seen what how people reacted to it when. Even the idea of doing this sort of this particular style of big budget SF was of was a radically new concept. Yeah. I mean the clue. Well, I mean it was it was great. Yeah. I mean I remember. I mean it was it was pretty packed if I remember correctly, and it was just everybody's like yeah whoa uh, you know it was and the thing is it was such it's just such a good story it mm -hmm. really is it's just a really good story. Uh, good versus evil, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's what kind of got lost in the the prequels, the three that came out. They had so much really, really good tech. Mm -hmm. The story and the writing was terrible. I um something in in the wake of this in the wake of the um of what what was referred to as New Hollywood by a lot of um film historians. Um, there started to be this romanticization of the of the soul creative vision, and a lot of that you can thank the um, film brats for. The film brats being, you know, Lu Lucas, Spielberg, Coppola, those guys, basically the first yeah. generation of fil of specific film school graduates who right. were, who had gotten who had um, learned under auteur theory. Mm -hmm. um, the problem. The, inf the problem that nobody could have seen is the fact that when it comes to those sort of creative endeavors, it's never truly this one creative vision that that's going on. You usually have, with a lot of really great stories, you have you certainly have the one person running the ship, but you have people who are on the same level who you can who you can bounce ideas off of and. I think with the pre with the prequels onward, that's what was, and even to an extent, Return of the Jedi, that's what was lost. Not having yeah. some not having somebody to really contest um, Lucas in that regard, because there's this idea of he's the he's the magic maker. He's the guy who made Star. He's the guy who made Star Wars. He's the guy who made THX one one three eight. Right. But you didn't have anybody to. But when it came to the prequels, you didn't have anybody to. Um, look at what he was writing and and say, this is incomprehensible because that's exactly what happened with the original with the original script version of um, Star Wars. He had a lot of people telling him, this is you, this is this makes absolutely no sense. You need to start refining this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it was it was blatantly on uh, obvious in the the prequels because my my wife we were, we recently watched all of them again. And, you know, it was she was like, God, that was she, she's a writer. And she's mm -hmm. very good. And uh, she actually uh, even wrote a, a film called uh, Bro that got produced with uh, Danny Trejo. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny because she's 
looking at that and she's like, my God, that's awful. <laughs> and she really breaks it down because she used to study, you know, so many scripts and, and writers and all that. And uh, and she said, oh, you know, it would have been better if they'd done this, that, 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 that. And I just went, damn, it would have. <laughs> it, cer- it certainly would. It certainly would have. Um, although I, I will admit, lear- um, learning the learning the process of the cr- of the creation of just the original trilogy is a story in and of itself. Um, mm. Least of which being for um, part of the reason the reason why I bring up Return of the Jedi when it comes to that whole not having anyone to re- to really um, re- really stand up against um, Lucas was because was because of something that Lucas had planned from the beginning that ended up having unforeseen consequences because he he wanted all he wanted all of the movies to open up the exact same way but right. with empire you know the best one he um that he had Irwin Irvin Kirshner directing that and right. Kirshner wanted wanted it to open up with an Irvin Kirshner film because that that was kind of expected. Mm. Um, but because of the fact that Lucas got his way on that, the unforeseen consequence was him pissing off the DGA, the Directors Guild of America. And a lot of the and because of that, a lot of the directors that he wanted for future projects, he couldn't get because they were un, because they were affiliated with the guild. Right. And that's why he ended up, the guy he ended up getting to direct was um, up until that point his bit his big claim to fame was working on a Beatles documentary. He was basi- <laughs> he was basically there to he was basically a, a um, patsy for Lucas. Right. And that admittedly that is a little bit harsh, but that's ca- but it kind of goes to that point of with a with a lot of creative endeavors you have somebody that you that you can bounce ideas off of because if you just end up doing it yourself and then relying on um, feedback after the fact, it's not going to be right. as good as as when you can get feedback in phases. And I th- I've been watching the Mandalorian recently, and that and that's definitely a Which case is of amazing, that. Yeah, it, it is. I just. I just finished. Um, I just finished with like the first episode of season two, where they, and yeah, it's definitely CG with the crate dragon that they show in, but they go out of their way to make to make it as terrifying as one would expect. Mm-hmm. Um, even if I ended up making a Dune joke while I was watching the thing, <laughs> but you look at something like that, and while you definitely, you definitely have. You have the sort of back and forth with the duo of Favreau and Filoni. Like I'm, pr- yeah. I'm pretty sure that if you were to be a fly on the wall in the writers' room, you've got those two um, bouncing ideas each of- off of each other, where somebody suggests something and then the other person says, I don't, "I don't know about that. Maybe we should do it like this," and it just keeps going. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I, yeah, and I we love to watch the uh, the behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. You know, we're watching the, the, the roundtable discussions afterwards and all that. It was just like, yeah, it's just great. Yeah. And it, even Kim's kind of nerding out over that stuff, um, you know, which is cool because, I mean, I nerd out over this stuff. I'm all Star Trek, Star Wars. I've seen them all and, you know, love it. Are you but getting her are you, in, are you, that's cool. Are you aware about how um, A New Hope almost started an, an international incident? Uh, No. <laughs> well, for Tatooine, they were filming on location in Tunisia, and c- because Lucas's background was in documentaries, he had the edict of make everything as real looking as possible. Well, one of the neighboring countries kind of got the wrong idea when they when they got when they um, got photos of the sand crawler that was being that was being made for Episode Four. <laughs> Where they th- where they thought it was a weapon by the Tunisian military, right? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, it's again, it's it's one of it's it would have it, it's one of those things that could have gone completely wrong very fast if if cooler heads didn't prevail. Yeah, yeah, it could definitely be a weird weird situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, of course, when it comes when it, and since you mentioned Star Trek, when it comes to something like that, it's um. It's kind of, it's kind of funny that the that 
A film like Wrath of Khan managed to do as well as it did in 1982, which, is, which if you look at what came out that year, that was an incredibly packed year. Mm. Like, that was the year you had, um, B- you had Beastmaster, you had Tron, you had The Thing, eh, and just so, and just so many well, other, um... Hmm? Especially Beastmaster, man. Yeah. You just had, you, were, for sci for science fiction and fantasy, 1982, I consider that to be one of the, one of the greatest years for film, simply because, were there better films that came out other years? Yeah. Were there yeah. more? Were there more films that came out other years? Also, yeah. But in terms yeah. of the number of classics that came out in just one year, um, I don't think that's been topped. And wasn't uh, like Raiders of the Lost Ark somewhere in there? I think I would have I would have to double check. Anyway, uh, this has gone off the rails into <laughs> deep, deep sci-fi. <laughs> territory. Oh, um, 1981. So close, but not quite. And even with the even with the not as even with the films that are objectively not as good, they're still they're still at least interesting. Like, say Hercules that came out a year later, um, which I will admit I, I will admit is definitely not a good movie, but it's def- but it's definitely one that is great for riffing, especially since Wait, you have Her- Lou Ferrigno. Hercules, throwing- the one with Lou Ferrigno. Yeah. Oh dear God! Yeah, the one where he throws a bear into space. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love Lou, but yeah. <laughs> I actually have a picture of me with uh, I, I. It's funny because whenever I came here, uh, so this uh, I'm appearing right now. The reason why I'm still in Australia is because I was appearing in uh, Melbourne and uh, Gold Coast. Well, the first time I came back to Australia. Um, back in 2007 maybe 2008 Mm -hmm. was melbourne and brisbane Mm -hmm. and it was with lou ferrigno um and several other people it was so funny because i've got a picture of lou ferrigno choking me lovingly (laughs) and uh michael winslow about to stick a uh chopstick up my nose um and yeah it was it was it was the best con i've ever been to (laughs) because it was two cons and I met all those people and made lots of other friends that are, I'm still friends with to this day. And, uh, yeah, it was wild. Craziness. What's with the ch- what was with the chopsticks, though? Like, the, the choking thing, I can, I can definitely see that. that oh, I don't I, We were out at dinner somewhere, <laughs> and it was just the goofy thing. I've, I've got to post it. I, got, I have a lot of these pictures that this was a kind of pre um, – not, not pre-internet, but I had them up on my website. Mm-hmm. When I first got out, and my first website was World O Spike, and I had these things up. It's like, hey, Hollywood Nights. Here's you know what I'm doing. Here's me pictures of me with this person, that person, that, you mm-hmm. know that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> but it was, uh, yeah, it was fun. I had some crazy stuff going on. Yeah, uh, I've done some weird shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank. You. Oh, thank. I was gonna make a jo- I was gonna make a joke about cur- about cursing, but as far as anyone know, you could you could have just been using the acronym, you know, ship high sure. in transit. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to curse here. No, 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 no. I I am under no illusions about, about cursing because I go through the seven dirty words as as a personal mantra as a personal mantra every Perfect. week. <laughs> Perfect. Um. And I w- I um. I will. I will admit that he, that it's always interesting hearing the behind the scenes with with a lot of films. Um, and with with something like Wrath of Khan, there's the there's the fact that, um, the the um the whole th- the whole thing with Spock's death that was originally going to happen earlier than it did. But when the, but the initial um st- the initial. Sc- I think it was the initial script or the initial plot summary got got put got put out early, possibly by yeah. Gene because Gene was not ha- Gene was not happy with what he considered to be the militarization of Trek, which I've joked yeah. about for years. And instead, and a lot of people had the whole notion of you can't kill off Spock, and um, Harv ben- Harv Bennett, who who was ha- who was handling the project, had basically said. Yeah, you can. The difference is if you is if you do it well. True story. True mm-hmm. story. 
Um, so instead instead of removing it, they just doubled and shifted it. Which is why you have the whole thing with um, Spock's son dying in the in er, in the um, early on. <clears throat> but it is it is it's always re it's always reassuring to to see how um th to see how there's no limits when it comes to geeking out because I think ev I think everybody has their own particular field that they that they will freely geek out about. Um, to the point where I, wa I once called fantasy sports um, D and D for people who don't want to admit it. <laughs> That's true. Mm -hmm. That's good. But, eh, but I think it. I think it's more a matter of fi of figuring out what what people's what people's geek out thing it is and what sort of stories they they'll de they'll delve into. Because with people who get with. You've probably seen this experience with people who will geek out about something. It's not a case of just lightly dipping into things. They will go. They will go all in. They will go all in on round tables and whatever and whatever they can soak up like a sponge. Yeah. But before things get a bit before things get a bit um, too crazy, I do I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come back to the temple. Hey, not a problem. As soon as I get off of here, I'm uh, popping on my own podcast. So, <laughs> good. And any any time you see fit to return to return to our Hollywood halls, the door is always open, my brother. Absolutely, uh, man. And oh, as I always say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Exquisite. <laughs> Exquisite. And of uh, course, so, oh, I I, I got to tell you though. Oh. Uh, so my, we've been, mm -hmm. well, obviously being down here in Australia, mm -hmm. a lot of good Australian wine, tell all your people to go out and buy a little Australian wine because China has done some import silliness with Australia. And there was a great, uh, video done by some of the, like prime ministers of the world saying, mm -hmm. I'll be drinking Australian wine tonight. You know, it's very cool. So go out and buy some Australian wine guys. Seriously. Oh, def definitely. And even even though I mentioned that I was scared off wine for years because of the Veda Kotzwein story, it's not like it's not like I'm going to turn away it now. It's just, it's yeah. just. Well, the Australian yeah. wines have gotten really good. I, mm -hmm. I'm drinking pretty much. That's all I drink. <laughs> <laughs> you know, down here. So uh, it's it's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And be sure and let everybody know about the Reluctant Heroes journey. I've yep. got the link mm -hmm. for them. I, you got to tell them um, that it's nineteen dollars a month, yeah. but if you get it through this right here, through mm -hmm. this podcast right here, yep. not, not, not my podcast, but through your podcast, mm -hmm. they've got a link. Um, and I can give, I guess I gave you the link. I don't know how you yes. can give that to them, but um, that would be mm -hmm. $11 a month. Mm -hmm. They'll, de they'll, um, they'll be, they'll definitely see the link. All they'd have to do is just scroll, is just scroll down a tiny bit and they'll, and they'll see that. Great. And I'm not now I'm not sure if that link just goes straight to a pay page. So I've also gave you the other link mm -hmm. that will show them the regular page that is at 19. But if they use your link, mm -hmm. you get a deal, yo. Yep. Animal and I'll do doing the, doing those kind of deals is is one of the great blessings of the of the hallowed halls of this temple. Heck yeah. But if, if, with all with all of that in mind, once again, a, a sincere thanks goes goes out to you Sp to you Spike and to everyone who was who um br who has the sufficient bravery to go to to go through the podcast and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay. Fucking frosty, everybody!